So, um, um, I got, um, I got invited to talk about, um, Tom that is going to follow up with this keynote. Um, so, um, I'm not going to t tell much about, I just, I mean, Tom is a very well respected member of this community. He's been around for quite a while already. Um, he, he's proposing and has been proposing um, quite interesting stuff for quite some time already. So, um, even if we cannot agree all the time, I mean, I admire him. And I think um, all the challenges that they are going to face with XDP is, um, I mean, it's quite bleeding edge stuff, lots of risk on it. I think is, I mean, it's a book that uh, requires to be quite brave to, to make it and, and courageous. So, um, well, anyway, I think, um, um, I think he's doing good work. And well, he is going to follow up with this undiscovered internet keynote. And well, he's going to mix all the stuff that we, we've been talking about in this conference and, and try to, so to put it in a way that provokes us how to think, how, how things are going to be, and, and what, what the future would look like. So I'd love you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> so I promise not to mention XDP. Um, I think we've, <laughs> we've, uh, we've um, covered that. However, I do want to talk about Pokemon Go. Um, if you remember last summer, and I know that seems like a long time ago, there was this thing called Pokemon Go, and we had people, and I guess they still do it, walking around with their phones, tripping over things. Um, my, my daughter was really into it, and they are like, you got to take me downtown, we're going to do Poke Walk. And I, I, I thought Poke Walk down sounds really strange to me, but it turns out they go around and they, they catch these Pokemons and they get points. Um, but the interesting thing to me, uh, from an engineering point of view, and my daughters don't care about my point of view, the interesting thing, um, there's two parts to this. One is, I look at the technology behind this, and the fact that, to a large extent, it's the, the efforts of, of people in this room, uh, people in, in the development of protocols, people in operating systems and applications, but it's really us who made this happen. And, you know, just seeing that fixing like, like this bug or that bug, it does have this percolating effect that we're changing culture, which is actually kind of cool. Uh, but the second thing is, I look at this and I see a, a glimpse of the future. This is really a type of augmented reality, if you think about it. So the, the Pokemons are being placed in the real world as if they're there. You see on your phone, they're not actually there, obviously. So to me, this is really fascinating because it's the future, and I don't see much of a gap between people catching Pokemons on their phone versus a firefighter entering a building wearing a VR device, being able to see through smoke, get the layout of the building, and basically finding people and saving them. So this stuff is really important um, in terms of, of where the future is going. It's, it's not just about games. I think that's the said way, but it's really about um, building this kind of a future world. So I want to do a thought experiment or, or encourage you to do the, the following thought experiment. Imagine the year is 2100 and they're doing the retrospective of the 21st century. So what will the great techno technological achievements be of the century? So I'm going to assume for a second that we'll, we'll discount any medical advances. So if uh, there's a cure for cancer, obviously that, that'll be on top of the list. Um, most likely, or at least hopefully, we'll have supersonic flight uh, be common. But I think that if you look at um, things that are pertaining to, to where we're looking at today, there's a few things, and, and there's a common theme here. So uh, robotics and in industry and home um, will become very common. Uh, the so-called smart cities, where we have sensors everywhere, Resources for cities are being directed in real time. Um, remote health care, surgery. Uh, obviously, the, the advantages of your doctor not even have to, to do surgery on you, um, but can do it remotely is great. And, of course, uh, self-driving cars. 
Uh, as we've seen um, last summer, that was also the other big news. Nearly every major automobile uh, manufacturer now saying self driving cars by 2020. Um, but in year 2100, what I'm assuming is our grandchildren will look back and all of this stuff will just be the way it is. And maybe they'll be like, a steering wheel, what is that? So if you do this thought experiment, um, we get to interesting scenarios like this. Unfortunately, this did not convert correctly. This is supposed to be an animation. And what it would show is a representation of cars in an intersection kind of flying through the intersection, not hitting each other, narrowly missing each other. Uh, I find this interesting because this is actually traffic scheduling, real traffic scheduling, um, that will come to be. So this eliminates traffic jams. So one of the um, outcomes of this, or one of the, I guess, foundations of this future, does seem to be IoT and an IoT-based internet. And this is where we really talk about finally scaling the internet out. So the way I look at it right now, in a large extent, we're really at an infancy in the internet and networking. If you think about the scale, we have about 6.4 billion devices today on the internet, 20 uh, billion by um, 2020, and 5G has some crazy expectations to scale like 500 billion devices on the internet. So at some point we're talking about light, each light bulb being on the internet and things like that. Um, this is going to generate vast amounts of data. Uh, of presumably most of these devices will have cameras. They'll be generating all, all the uh, video, what have you. Um, it's also going to become predominantly a machine-to-machine -machine internet. So devices talking to devices as opposed to humans um, talking to, to humans or devices. So I think we're going to see a shift there. Uh, distributed decision making, so um, cloud is, or data centers are great, but I think we're going to see some pushing out, uh, more distribution, not less. Geographic locality becomes important, and I'll get to that in, in a minute. Applications are going to require low latency, and this is going to be very different from what we see today in terms of latency, and um, I'll give some uh, reasons why that is. But, one of the important things is, um, like my firefighter, firefighter example, we're going to be supporting life-critical applications on the internet. So things like reliability, security, privacy, these will no longer be things we need tomorrow. Without these, we can't build uh, this sort of internet. So for real-time internet, um, you know, we always often hear everything's about latency. Uh, this is true, but what we really mean is it's about latency, variability, security, availability. Um, again, 99 percentile latency, or, or in, in, I think in the case of IoT internet, the five nines latency, five nines availability. These are going to become important, and these are going to be our targets uh, as we build the, the software and the networking out. We need to achieve uh, these sort of numbers. So I mentioned the um, challenges of latency, and, and the way I like to think about it is we have a, a kind of a latency continuum. And on the far right, we have basically the internet, and we've accepted relatively large latencies on the internet, uh, typically order hundreds of milliseconds, maybe more if you go through satellite. This is probably twofold. One is um, speed of light is actually a, a real hard limit. We can't go faster than speed of light. so. By definition, if you're going to a satellite and back to Earth, it's going to be uh, hundreds of milliseconds. But the other um, aspect of latency on the internet really has been uh, retransmissions, RTOs, uh, things like that. So how many RTTs does it take to get my data? If it's one, then I'm bound up by speed of light. If it's two, well, then I'm doing 2x of what I should be. So we've obviously done a lot of great work on this. Uh, the BBR sounds really promising to um, to manage this latency and get it down. Goal should be, though, is uh, RTT should be correlated to speed of light, even on lossless internet as the BVR guys, or lossful internet as the BVR guys are showing us. On the left side, we have kind of latencies we expect in the data center. And this sort of latency is not so much dominated by speed of light. Uh, we're actually building data centers with a lot of locality. A rack of machines, we expect... Um, I guess, nanosecond transmission. Where the latency comes 
out, or the latency problem here is actually the implementation. So as we've seen in a lot of discussion um, in this conference about uh, various performance techniques, these are actually part of the implementation, uh, make the implementation faster. So we'll go into scheduling or how we do queuing, um, how we arrange packets, things like that. Now in the middle of this, and I think this is kind of where we get into the uh, next generation or, or the type of latencies that, that we'll need, I think there's a mid-range latency here. And this is in the order of maybe one millisecond to 10 milliseconds. And the reason we need this particular latency is if you think about it, especially in the self-driving car, if two cars are coming at each other, they're going to be exchanging information to avoid a collision. The response time that we want that to be is about 10 milliseconds or less. Uh, human response time is around 40 milliseconds, so we're really getting that down. If we get the latency down so that devices can communicate safety information, then obviously, then we have a safer, safer environment. This is a, a key to enabling the self-driving cars, is how the devices are going to communicate amongst themselves to solve a particular problem. In this case, the problem is um, safe driving for everyone. So the techniques, though, here are kind of interesting because they're probably a combination of, of both types of techniques. Clearly on the protocol side, uh, TCP probably isn't what people would use for this. One of the interesting aspects of a protocol like this is it, the information is very time bounded. So if I send information for a car to stop and it doesn't get that and I have to resend that um, 20 milliseconds later, it's probably too late then. So uh, retransmissions might turn into something like forward error correction. Um, on the devices, we don't need the super microsecond latency, but we certainly need um, like real-time scheduling and, and things like that. So I think there's a, a kind of a combination of that. So the solution here might be a little bit different than either of these um, other sides of the continuum. So looking a little more at the stack. Um, this is where I guess we come in on, on how we're going to help advance this future. So I think there's uh, several challenges that we're starting to look at um, and, and we need to continue to look at. And I'll go into a little bit in each of these today or in a minute. Uh, but security, protocol classification, offloads and kernel bypass, um, definitely a hot issue. IPv6, I'm, I'm inclined to think that's the predominant protocol, networking protocol in this world. Uh, the actual transport protocols need to be addressed, mobility and latency. So in security, I think the writing is on the wall in this one. This is no longer a nice to have. Um, obviously with, with Snowden revelations, major uh, service providers, content providers have already turned up TLS on the internet. I tend to think that that's only the beginning. I do think we need to get security inside the data center. Um, obviously, for IoT devices, almost any communication needs to be secure. We, we can't have um, devices on the side of the road imitating cars and sending false signals. Uh, it's a huge issue in the IoT world. And part of this, though, is um, historically the cost of crypto has prevented us from ubiquitous security. That, I think, we just need to drive down the efforts around uh, CPU um, Things like uh, KTLS is, is one way to do that. The security offloads uh, have a lot of promise, new instruction sets, uh, what have you. One thing we have to realize about security is uh, the threat never goes away, it only gets worse. So every time we come out with a, a security mitigation, someone else will try to outdo that. Uh, in this hyper-connected world of IoT, it's only gonna get worse in terms of threats. So our response has to be commensurate with that. Um, and then one other um, side effect of this is we see a lot of movement between user space and kernel. Um, regardless of where code runs, hardware or software, it's going to be a, a question that we're faced with, vendors are faced with, how do you secure this? Uh, as we know, the security of a system is usually its weakest link, so if the kernel is secure but user space isn't, then the system isn't secure. So we have to consider security from a, a kind of a whole point of view, holistic point of view. The other thing about security that we have to consider in terms of latency is security negotiation 
actually impacts latency. So we have to consider that. Uh, in the self-driving car case, two cars come into range with each other and the radio signals. If they need to spend a lot of time secu uh, negotiating the security so they can trust each other, um, as they're driving down the road, that distance it gets shortened. They may not have enough time to actually respond uh, when they realize they're about to have a crash. So security negotiation is absolutely critical in this kind of IoT, uh, secure IoT world. So protocol specification, um, we actually talked a lot about this at last NetDev. I think um, Dave's keynote was mostly about this. It is still kind of a problem. It's not specific to really just this room. Uh, the problem extends to how we develop internet protocols, um, how router vendors, switch vendors, uh, parse things, what they're looking at. Whenever someone does something that is kind of outside of the normal protocol, like uh, doing deep packet inspection in the HTTP like um, vendors have been doing, they're running the risk of, of protocolification. And the problem with protocolification is it kind of freezes it. We can't move the internet forward if we can't change protocols because it's going to break uh, someone who made kind of a bad assumption about how the lower layer protocols work. So it turns out this is a well-known problem. Um, and last uh, IETF, this was actually brought up in the open plenary. And one of our colleague, colleagues in IETF basically said the only solution is to encrypt the hell out of the packet. Uh, meaning we have to get to the world where even the transport layer, the payload, everything's encrypted. The only way, only thing devices can see are things that um, allow routing the packet and decrypting it at the endpoint. They will lose a lot and in, in terms of what they see or what they think they want today. So firewalls, for instance, now we're going to have to deal with the fact that they might not see TCP headers. Um, for this room, I think we've we kind of harped on the, the request that device vendors follow the less is more model, uh, particularly with, with hardware offloads. Uh, try to avoid pigeonholing us into using uh, a particular say, encapsulation protocol when we could have implemented a generic mechanism that allows us to use arbitrary encapsulation protocols. Kernel bypass is um, kind of a hot topic right now. Um, the way I look at it is there's different dimensions of this. And the most important one uh, might be kind of the flavor of it. So we, we can divide the world of kernel bypass into complete bypass, uh, meaning the kernel has no interaction with this. This would be kind of like the DPDK world. There's partial bypass, which is the kernel may do part of the data path um, and then, for instance, transition it to user space, kind of how we do with net, some of the net map stuff. And then the third one is kind of acceleration, which is what we think of in terms of TSO, LRO, checksum offload, where the kernel, the, the code doesn't run in the kernel, but it's really running, running on behalf of the kernel, under control of the kernel. There's some other um, dimensions we can think of where the implementation is. Is it in hardware, software, user space? Uh, the data path API, a lot of uh, by, bypass, like TCP and user space really wants to use sockets, but we have to acknowledge that uh, RDMA uses verbs, MPI, some other things like that. Another important aspect is how is this stuff controlled? So in the kernel, for instance, we like to have control through Netlink. Um, that has a huge advantage to provide a common tool set. If the offload requires completely different tool set, that's fine, but now we have kind of this divergence. And the worst case scenario is I have two parties trying to basically control the same device, but with con completely different methods, and I'm kind of crossing my fingers to hope that they don't conflict with one another. Uh, the, the scope is actually another very important thing, and I think the world is kind of dividing into two, um, two intents of bypass. So one is the so-called packet processing, uh, switches, filtering, firewalls, things like that. Those can be offloaded into, into hardware. Um, they can be acceleration or complete or partial bypass. The other one um, that we have to consider is actually protocol termination. And this is um, demonstrated in TCP over DPDK, open onload. Uh, there is a, a pretty good market or a pretty good um, story about 
these guys running TCP in user space, getting great results. Um, some of that stuff uh, kind of difficult for us. I, I, I think for us, the easier one is going to be solve packet processing. So we can think of kernel bypass in terms of, of friendliness to the kernel. How does, it, how does it interact with the kernel? How does it integrate? And so as I mentioned, there are three flavors. Uh, complete bypass, by definition, it's outside of the kernel. So the partial bypass of the world, that's kind of a little better, at least part of it's in the kernel. And then acceleration, this is completely integrated with the kernel. So I should mention these colors are, are really from the kernel perspective um, in terms of, of probably our point of view as, as to how well we can integrate this stuff. So this ordering kind of provide, or this um, annotation provides a path. Um, kind of how we would want to view accelerations as they come in. Can we move complete acceleration to partial acceleration? Can we partial to um, um, partial offload to full acceleration? So I put together a, a little slide um, trying to do a uh, kind of survey of the various forms of, of offload. Um, very scattered information on the internet, actually. So get marshalling this together was kind of a, an interesting exercise. Um, but there are a lot of implementations, uh, a lot of um, stories about success with this. Uh, some of the interesting statements are often along the lines of a general kernel op operating system is just too slow. We need to do bypass because we need uh, 20 million packets per second, and the kernel only does 2 million. So in fact, it's, it's really that mentality that, that created some of the efforts, um, I promise not to mention them, but created some of the efforts of uh, high-performance data paths. So in one sense, you can argue that that, that was good input, so now we know um, what the targets are and, and how to be competitive uh, with things like DPDK. So I take that kind of as a positive. Um, but we do need to respond to this, and it, it, it is important to demonstrate um, a path to getting stuff in the kernel with really good performance. So there's a few questions um, I think we always want to ask about, about offloads and kernel bypass. Uh, first question I would ask anyone who says, hey, this, this kernel bypass is great, is like, why do you need it? Um, what is it really doing for you? And one thing I would, I would also like to point out is historically in the data center, with any complex hardware offload, it's really a pain to, to get it to deployment. Um, scaling, is, scaling these sort of things is really hard. So I, I mentioned that previously we have five basic offloads. It turns out those are really, as far as I know, the only really wide scale, widely spread, um, deployed offloads that's not to say we don't want um, other offload solutions. I think uh, generic BPF offload sounds really exciting. But bear in mind, this stuff is really hard to deploy at scale. And the reason it's hard to deploy at scale is because we kind of encounter Murphy's Law continuously. Edge conditions will pop up. A one in a million event in a, in a large scale data center happens like every other minute or something like that. So that's the issue, and that, that's why it's really hard to, to get the offload into data centers. Um, we also have to consider how to, how to rectify those advanced offloads with less is more. Uh, sometimes listening to, to kind of both sides of this argument seems like they can contra contradict each other. So moving forward, exactly how does less is more and, and the advanced hardware offloads, how do they um, play together well? And then the last bullet, um, actually I kind of thought about this with some of the P4 discussion in TC. If we offload P4 using TC, but we don't actually have an implementation of P4 on the host, does that really constitute an offload? It's kind of a, a philosophical question. Uh, I think that's more of a kernel bypass. And the problem there is if we offload something uh, from the kernel to a specific, specific piece of hardware and we don't have a, a kernel fallback, that kind of creates a little bit of a gap and a little bit of um, reliance of the kernel on a specific piece of hardware. So the good news is in the, in the P4, I think uh, John mentioned that there's a uh, P4 to BPF compiler. So I think by that definition, we actually do have P4 
in the kernel by virtue of uh, compiling in, into BPF. So good news is we should never have to actually implement P4 in the kernel. I think that would be uh, not a good thing to do. So turning to IPv6, um, I, I mean, I don't know what to say. IPv6, if you look at the, the statistics, if you look at the graphs, it's an exponential curve. Um, I know we've been saying for a long time it's coming, but we're at about 12%. Uh, that's up. Um, U.S., I believe it's like 28%. Uh, we have instances of, of large uh, data centers running IPv6, IPv6 only. Obviously, Facebook um, was one of the first to do that, but I believe other data centers are going to quickly follow suit. There's also been talk, even in IETF, how do we sunset IPv4? So I, I've been working on uh, IPv6 actually from the beginning and watching it through the years, just the fact that people in the Standards Committee and IETF are even suggesting that it's time to, to sunset IPv4, it's an amazing, amazing accomplishment. What that means to us, though, is when we get patches, when we do development, please, IPv6 is important. Please test IPv6. I would love to see us get to the point where um, patches come into the kernel that support IPv6, and the statement is, we'll get to IPv4 later on. That would be a huge accomplishment. Uh, right now, it's kind of the other way around. So um, bear in mind, this is important. Um, we have companies, we have people who are living on this stuff. It can't be considered a, a secondary thing at this point. Uh, we still have a few weak areas with respect to performance. Um, obviously, we've, we've done a lot uh, with that. But Testing um, with IPv6 and continuing with uh, good development should resolve that. So protocols, um, we're kind of on the, the rise of UDP on the internet. I think that for various reasons, uh, TCP won't, won't dwindle, but a lot of new applications, um, obviously we're seeing new transport protocols, QUIC uh, as a good example, will be UDP based. So the historical problem with UDP or any other protocol on the internet was, does it get through the internet? Do routers or switches actually route it? Uh, TCP over IPv4 always has been the safe bet. Uh, IPv6 was kind of the first uh, volley in, in the war of getting the internet to change to use a different protocol. We, we saw how that goes. Hopefully the transition to UDP uh, won't be nearly as bad. But the belief about UDP is that it is the protocol that's amenable to the internet. Uh, what you don't see, for instance, is SCTP uh, or other new protocols. Those seem less likely. But UDP actually has some advantages. It's a fairly lightweight protocol. If we can get it through the internet, uh, we can use things like DTLS to hide transport layers. So I think the conclusion um, from this for us is that UDP is, is important. UDP performance is going to be important, uh, optimizing this. I think that there are opportunities with BPF to maybe do UDP um, application layer protocol offloads. For instance, a GRE or GRO for some UDP application might, might come to be. Um, I really like that model, by the way, because we don't have to put application-specific code in the kernel with something like BPF. Um, there's a huge value in that. It, it opens up a lot of, of ability to program the kernel without actually programming the kernel and, and, and writing kernel code. So it's a clear uh, win for BPF in that regard. So mobility, um, this, is, this is absolutely critical. This world of IoT, uh, everything will be mobile. I know at, at companies like Facebook and Google, we've been mobile first mentality for a few years. Uh, the, the, the demographics, everything shows it's all about mobile at this point. So what we want, though, is a seamless and transparent mobility with low latency. Now, mobility, um, we have to think in terms of what, what are the solutions? How do we make uh, networking TCP mobile? And I think right now there are kind of three possible solutions to this. Uh, do it at the application layer or multiple connections somehow. Do it at a network layer or um, disassociated location, which I'll describe in a minute. So application layer, I think this is the most common form of mobility. 
And it can be really trivial. Your uh, smartphone just opens up connections to both your Wi-Fi and your mobile carrier. And as you move around, it just picks which, the application actually picks which connection to use. Uh, it's kind of dumb. It has uh, several cons. Obviously, if we are driving around and we have to reestablish TCP connections just because we went to a new uh, base station in mobile, there's a lot of, of costs associated with that. Fortunately today, it's, it's um, not so critical because it's humans using this. So for instance, if you're watching a video and we have to switch networks and there's a reconnection, presumably video buffering would make it seamless. But in the world of machine-to-machine, uh, -machine, the self-driving cars, this is going to be a major problem if we have to continuously reestablish TCP and take those extra round trip times. Uh, I would mention MPTCP uh, as kind of a variant of this. Um, this has obviously been around a long time. Um, I think for, for pretty good reasons it's not yet in Linux. Maybe someday it will be. Uh, I don't think it particularly solves any this problem very differently, except it makes the multi-connection multi transparent to the application, which probably has a significant value. But the um, network and the network topology, the multi-connections aren't visible to transport layers, so I think that's still kind of a problem. Network layer mobility is another solution. I guess this is kind of a, a follow-on on IP mobility. We have ILA um, that I kind of presented yesterday. This is one solution. The idea of using ILA or even encapsulation in mobility is that as you move around, switch from network to network, your IP address basically goes with you and the network figures out how to do the routing uh, to make sure packets get to you and, and informs everyone else where you're at. So presumably this is something that can be implemented completely in the network uh, without any um, visibility on, on the end device so your smartphone doesn't need to know uh, what it's connected to or even the fact that it's, it's switched networks. This can, to a large extent, be done uh, in the network. The pro of this is, uh, as I mentioned, it's transparent to the network. Um, problem is crossing carriers becomes kind of difficult, so um, there's a lot of information um, in terms of mapping that needs to be exchanged between parties who participate in this. So while you're in one network, it's probably pretty easy. Uh, trying to figure out how this would work between, say, Verizon and AT&T, trying to exchange information about uh, mobile parties, a little bit more challenging. So that, that um, might make this uh, a little less um, applicable in some use cases. So disassociated location is, is probably um, kind of the newer one of these. And I think this idea is really uh, being inspired by Quick. I'm not sure if they really fully uh, fleshed out the ramifications of this. But the idea is that instead of identifying, say, a TCP connection by IP addresses and port numbers, we identify the connection by some sort of connection identifier that is within uh, within the packet. And the connection identifier only has meaning to the sender and the receiver. So as long as I have a path from, from the sender to the receiver and I send this um, packet with a connection identifier, it's only at the receiver does it look at that connection identifier and as long as that's unique with all the other connections on the host, it can identify that as packet as being part of the connection. So what this gives us is we no longer have to worry about um, IP addresses and ports as being meaningful into the connection. And this really becomes evident when you consider what happens when a NAT uh, translation times out. So if I have a TCP connection through a NAT, uh, the NAT box creates a stateful association between um, the packets that are coming in and the translated packets. As long as that state exists, everybody's happy. If that state goes away and my client sends a new packet, the NAT device won't have a state and it has to drop the whole connection. We, we cannot recover from that. And as a result of this, we unfortunately ended up in this crazy world where we have to design applications or TCP to constantly send keep lives just to keep, potentially keep NAT state alive 
regardless if it's there. So there's a whole um, number of wasted packets on the internet just from keep alive. Disassociated location, this problem doesn't exist. If, if the translation changes, say, say I'm using UDP with um, Quick, if the translation changes, that's fine. Uh, when the client sends a new packet, it'll get a new set of IP addresses, uh, possibly a new set of ports. As long as it goes to the same destination, the receiver doesn't care about the port numbers. All they care is about is what this connection identifier is. Now, there is a huge caveat to this. Uh, strong security is required. It would be far too easy for somebody to hijack connections uh, just by uh, guessing connection identifiers. So as long as you have strong security to validate the connection identifier, there's a lot of promise uh, in this approach. Uh, one con, though, is that if you do move, say, either in NAT or your client moves from network to network, the server won't actually know um, the new location. So, th so the server has to know where to send packets. So we expect that the client would have to actually send the first packet after it moves to actually get the server to, to be able to send back. So um, last but not least uh, on the list is latency. So not a lot to say. Um, we're, I think we're, we're approaching latency in, in all the right aspects. Um, the, the middle ground latency, I think, is the one area. Um, these, um, as I said, mentioned, the, the middle ground protocols, the, the latency um, pr sensitive protocols that we expect to have about 10 milliseconds or less. Uh, we will have to kind of uh, consider if there's any considerations uh, in the kernel for those. Uh, but other than that, I think most of the most of the work here is actually pretty well promoting um, the the latency story. So I think we're doing really well on that. Um, so with that, um, I also want to thank uh, the organizers of NetDev. Uh, I thought it was, uh, you know, so far a fantastic conference. Um, a lot of good things. Uh, I think um, yesterday's uh, dinner was great, and um, thank you for having me. Any questions? So, Tom, you had a slide on IoT security, and in my opinion, you left out the elephant in the room. Even if you had everything encrypted and everything else on your slide was taken care of, what's the update model? Because even if you're completely secure, if every Philips light bulb in the world has a root hole, you could shut down the lights in the middle of a surgery in a, in a hospital somewhere. I, I meant to put that one on the slides. Okay. Um, that, should be, that should be a story in itself. Uh, the, there's two, two threats to IoT right now. One is just basic security. One is IoT. Um, too many home routers, for instance, right now are not updated. And that's, a, that's an order of magnitude smaller problem than IoT updates. Yeah. Um, it's kind of fundamental. If we don't solve the problem, it won't happen. Uh, the internet cannot move forward unless we solve the update problem. Uh, the stories, so, so, so thinking about your, um, your transports over UDP yesterday, I will acknowledge in some extent we're, we're punning on the problem um, in something like that. It, it does not solve the underlying pro problem. The underlying problem is actually pretty simple. We cannot upgrade, update critical software in the field. Then it do network, like, networking doesn't matter, your rest of your kernel, your, even whatever application is, is critical. If you can't do that securely, reliability, reliably, and quickly and efficiently, it's not going to happen. Well, perhaps part of the issue is that we've allowed vendors to all basically agreed to say there's only a limit to how far we have to support our devices in, in the world today and then once we get past this time period we don't have to worry about them anymore and that's, yeah, that's, that's why we have the user experience we have right now. And then 20 years later it's, it's still supporting this legacy stuff and this out protocol ossification happens, right? If we can't change, if we can't fix stuff, we can't change, change stuff for the better. It, it's a huge problem. Um, I, I don't know if we can do anything in particular uh, it's obviously, it's obvious to me we're one small part of this. Um, as I mentioned, uh, the transports over UDP is just a band-aid. Um, yeah, we were having that con exact conversation at lunch the other day. What does it mean if, 
if somebody can hack into your light bulb because they didn't up, update the Linux on the light bulb. I don't know. I mean, you know, again, I'm hoping in 100 years or whatever, our, our kids or I guess our great grandkids just look back and laugh that this was ever considered a problem. Um, I do believe it will be solved, but I mean, what can I say? It's going to take a lot of hard work, and you know, this is why we're here. Yeah, I actually think it's a political problem. You actually have to do politics and, and put in like lawyers to say you have to support these devices and we will sue you if you don't update them, or else it's not going to happen. Yeah, because otherwise you make a business case decision that's cheaper not to. It, it comes down to a business case decision. If it's cheaper to be insecure and the cheaper is a political legal cost. Yeah, it's absolutely better to be insecure. Right? If you're trying to get to market, yeah. you, you, you ship an insecure product and you ship it. Yeah. If, otherwise, you, somebody else sells it in right. front of you. It's even worse than that, though, because companies will go bankrupt, and even if they were supporting stuff, they will stop supporting stuff, and you'll have hardware that's abandoned. Perhaps the customer needs to agree that the device is only rented, and they rent it for 20 years or whatever, and then you know it stops working. That's the only solution that I've heard. No, it's. I don't know. I mean, I think it's our problem to solve, but um, yeah, it's it's a huge challenge. So. I, I want to say something else first. Thanks for covering this this sort of wide swath of things. Um, IPv6 is dear to my heart. No, before only code need to apply to my code base because it'll get rejected. Uh, but uh, um, and and UDP and mobility. I think we're actually starting to get that working with quick and connection IDs and and multipathing and fast failover. So that's that's really great. Uh, one thing I wanted to say, though, um, that's a bit concerning to me is that you said everything needs to be secure and encrypted. And I agree, but um, we're putting an awful lot of eggs in one basket. If we rely on one layer of TLS for everything, uh, then we're going to have um, extremely powerful you know, state actors um, trying to subvert that and trying to compel people to hand over the keys. And those actors may be, you know, and, and you, we're seeing this in enterprises today, right? The problem is that TLS is, is Boolean, right? Either you have it and the cert is there and it's secure, or somebody gets your cert and it's totally insecure. And so if we put too many eggs in this one TLS basket, we risk that, you know, some corporation that says, I own this device, I need to be able to man in the middle everything, can 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 subvert all the security, uh, or or some government says, you know, I need to be able to man in the middle every cert in my country because you know whatever, then they subvert all the security. And I think we need to think about this and say, okay, well, we should build a layered security model, because otherwise, you know, anyone who gets a, man, a, a root cert on a device controls everything. Is 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 it basically infinitely powerful? The Firewall vendors, router vendors, they, in some sense, they're terrified of, of encryption, encrypt everything. Um, they do want to be part of this. There are efforts to <clears throat> kind of allow a, a leakage of information so they could do, they could provide some layers of security. Um, they think of it more as, as getting back something that's been lost. So, for instance, if you think of a firewall, you know, they, they do provide some, um, or can provide a lot of value. I mean, I, I run a firewall at home uh, because we can filter out, out bad guys attacking. But in the, in the encrypted world, they lose that. So they do have some concepts of, of bringing the stuff back in. The challenge, though, is where do you draw the line? Um, what, so just by virtue of giving more information to the network to make it more secure, I'm also giving more information to the network, which can be used against me. And this is a, a, a difficult conundrum, because the, in, in the easiest view of the internet, we have uh, layer two, layer three, layer four. Layer three is switches and routers. They're only supposed to look at IP. They were never intended to implement security. Reality, we kind of got into that situation. So I, I, don't, I, don't mean, I, I don't know how to answer the question. And yet, yes, we have layers of security. But we do know that end-to-end -end security um, is sort of a must. If we can add to that, I think it's value. But I, I definitely think end-to-end -end security is going to be the norm. Yeah, to be clear, I agree with all of that. I'm just saying 
let's be careful about how many parties we array against one security because we only have like antecedent security is using TLS it's just one um, one security measure right a lot of actors want would like to subvert that security measure now you know we've got employers wanting to snoop on you we've got you know governments wanting to snoop on you um, you know, let's maybe let's try and see if we can avoid having the router vendors and the infrastructure providers also arrayed against you in this in this quest for end-to-end -end security. I'm wondering what we can do there. Now, I'm 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 glad that the I'm glad that the spot buff got shot down at the ITF. Don't get me wrong, I agree with you, but I'm just saying if if everybody if everybody stands to gain by having a man in the middle cert on the device, then everybody loses. And let's think about what we can do to limit the damage. Okay. That makes sense. So you made a comment about uh, XDP and BPF and P4 and that you didn't want to see a P4 implementation in the kernel. And I think because it's true that you can translate P4 to BPF and load that into the kernel, but you can't really translate BPF back to P4. So I think we're going to have to end up with a P4 implementation in the kernel uh, simply because we'll be wanting to be able to offload that to the hardware. And uh, if, if you translate it in user space and load BPF into the kernel, you'll, you won't be able to offload that. So... Uh, I think John wants to comment on that. It, it's sort of an interesting question because then you have a, a kernel infrastructure that is only used for offloading and has no realistic use for software, right? I mean, nobody's going to actually use it for, uh, to run software on. It's purely there as a hardware um, interface, which maybe fine i'm just saying that that's the kind of implication right it, it seems very wrong uh to have offload support for things we can't emulate for testing and other situations like that so even if the software implementation is very slow we should probably have it just for uh, for testing and compatibility all right so i don't think it's wrong is the right, right word but it's not the question is is that offload at that point or just bypass offload implies you had it on the host, you're getting benefit by putting it into the into the device. So to me, it's a little bit of a philosophical question. But why doesn't the the um, P4 to BPF solve the problem? Uh, because if you load that BPF into the device, it can, into the kernel, it can't offload it because there's no reasonable way to translate back from BPF to P4. Well, no, but if I offload the, P, the original P4. So they started with the original P4. I can get it in to run in the kernel as BPF. If I want to move it to the device, then I just go back to P4. Uh, well, at this point, you're requiring the user space tools to be aware of the hardware in the system and to basically say, oh, I'm loading a P4 file. The system doesn't have P4 offload capabilities. I will translate it to BPF and load it that way. And that doesn't seem conceptually clean. But well, uh, but we already have that with P4, right? I mean, you, you can't offload a P4 um, program to something that doesn't support P4. Thank you. Okay.